So this is a kind of a contrarian counterfactual, but a discussion on the opposite side of those who advocate strongly for engagement. Uh, and it comes from a guy who uh, for the last 10 years has been the one who's actually been talking to a Chinese counterparts uh, about these things. So I don't want to be too negative, but I would like to, I mean, the ideal is there and we really need to strive for that, but I just want to offer some thoughts on what the reality can be. And the first thing I'll point out um, is the subtitle here is, uh, the, the thing that comes to mind talking about this is Bonnie Raitt's song, uh, I Can't Make You Love Me If You Don't. There's got to be two sides in this uh, adventure and in this engagement. Uh, and if one side doesn't pick up, then you can have all the talks you want or try uh, without uh, any real progress. Uh, and then um, one of the things we'll talk about is how good the PRC is at uh, public diplomacy and public messaging. And this picture here from the very well-timed uh, summit between the two presidents uh, comes to mind. And if this is what the Global Times put out, Global Times messages primarily Chinese audiences, but also has an English version for the West. And it doesn't talk about the outcome. It talks about the, the, the form, not the substance, the form, the fact that the U.S. president had to stay up till midnight uh, while the Chinese president was able to uh, have a morning uh, event, basically saying one side wants this more than the other. Again, I'll offer you more examples on that, but in general, uh, we need to fight through this form and get to substance uh, of dialogue to make them effective. So we're going to go page down. How do we do that? Let's try that. There we go. Um, there's three takeaways on the right that you can look at, but um, lest this come across as too negative, there have been plenty of bright spots in the relationship, and there's still great potential for those. Um, this is a, when I was in Beijing, uh, counterpart Qi Jingguo, uh, three-star general, was in charge of handling the, the U.S. relationship. And he really did go out of his way, both in uh, travels through the U.S., where I accompanied him, and then when we were back in Beijing, this picture is taken by the, the Summer Palace, uh, and he presented me with this really nice scroll, which you see behind me here. This is a thing I value very much from the uh, uh, engagement and the relationship. So, look, it all is not lost. We're in a rough patch right now. I think everybody recognizes that, and I hope to offer some ideas on how we can get back to real dialogue, important dialogue. On the right side, look, number one, patience. Got to we, be prepared to wait. Let them come to us, make our expectations known, and don't chase the, the engagement uh, ball. It, 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 the results rarely uh, live up to their expectations. Second thing is when we do this engagement, and this is for anybody here, but also it's for the people I, in DC, and these are things I tried to do when I was there, is set objectives and then make them measurable. So you can tell, are we just having talks for talk's sake? Or are we actually getting something here? And the last one is both sides need to engage, not just one side. Uh, again, one hand, one hand of conversation. It is possible if the other side doesn't engage, and I'll talk about how you can uh, conduct diplomacy that way as well. But those are the three themes I wanna try to hit on in this presentation. Here's what I'm gonna talk about uh, in the flow here. What's the point of engagement? Uh, let's talk about the two different approaches because they are very different uh, and see if we can't find some overlap and then things we can do, um, recommendations toward more meaningful overlap. The photo at the bottom is uh, taken when the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Wendy Sherman, traveled not to Beijing, but to Tianjin, which is odd. They, they held her off outside of Beijing. Um, and here's uh, her, not her counterpart, but a guy, a layer below her, Shifeng, basically saying that the US is manipulating the relationship, doesn't value the relationship. Uh, and I think we all agree that that's not the case. They're doing this in the public space. And that's, uh, again, worth noting. I'll talk about that. Why do we engage? Uh, it's pretty easy. It's all about advancing uh, our national interests. And it's about advancing Chinese national interests where our interests align. Um, cooperate if we can, but uh, we definitely compete where we, where we have to. Um, when you do engage, uh, it's amazing how often you discover that the issues aren't as stark and black and white as they, you thought they were. In fact, you, you know, in these smaller groups in private, you discover that, yeah, we actually have a lot, or we have some things in common, and that becomes the basis for further negotiations. This is the essence of diplomacy. So for instance, from this last event, again, very fortuitous that the, they scheduled the summit to support my briefing today. I wanna thank everybody involved. Um, the President Xi Jinping's message was, we're just, we just want mutual respect from our old friends. That's a buzzword that uh, should cue you that something uh, is going to follow. But he wants uh, respect. He wants respect for the 
new type uh, governance system from that he's putting forth, this new authoritarianism. Uh, he wants respect for their handling of human rights issues in Xinjiang and Tibet, or the handling of Tibet of uh, Hong Kong or Taiwan. But he's looking for respect for their way of going about things. At the same time, uh, President Biden's uh, main statement there was that the PRC must respect the established global rules and norms. And so what I find in this is you've got the same word of respect, touching on different issues, but to me, this is an area where we can open a conversation. Uh, Grant Newsham, a uh, local Hawaiian res uh, resident, also a very uh, keen writer, notes uh, that, you know, the U.S. is in some ways conceded on this, that, and I'm guilty of this in, in my uh, interactions, is we assume that if we can just get to the table with these guys, if we just talk to them, they will see it our way, we will come to a, a conclusion, and the friction and the risks will go down. Well, uh, yes, in that photo you saw of the scroll, I have a very, or had a very positive relationship with my Chinese counterpart. The fact is, he's got to go back to the office, and he's got a boss. He's got to deliver uh, things too, in terms of the the Communist Party. So, um, you don't expect too much. You're going to have to uh, temper your uh, dependence on the personal relationship. Uh, in event that means you have to develop verification regimes because you can't go back to the personal. You can't pick up a phone, and call them, and we'll talk about how that worked with the trade talks. Um, we find often that um, the Chinese side will make agreements, they will sign agreements, but they will not be bound by them. Uh, during the, the Hong Kong um, events of 2019 and 20, they called the joint declaration scraps of paper. Uh, and then yesterday's speaker uh, on this, again, engagement topic, um, Dr. Potter made a good point uh, that the PRC needs to understand that a treaty agreement uh, is not a request, it's a expectation. So. What uh, can we expect from this, exp uh, from this effort? And then what is it the Chinese side expects? And again, they're not the same thing. This is uh, out of China Daily today. Uh, it's very helpful. They've been producing a lot of these um, statements for us, but they use the word fair competition. This is echoing the American point that I'll, in the next slide, I'll point out that American negotiators believe in fairness. They believe both sides really should come out of this happy because that will lead to a better and a long, longer lasting relationship. Um, but the, the second clause there is interesting, uh, that it's our fault, and the U.S. has to take steps to fix things. Uh, and that is where uh, we, of course, disagree. Uh, and that's, uh, but again, that's a basis for uh, the start of a conversation, hopefully in private, but we can have this in the public space as well. So if you don't, uh, other than three takeaways, I think this is the slide I worked hardest on. And, and again, it takes, try to distill down 10 years of understanding why we talk past each other so much. And to me, if we're gonna fix one thing in all of this, uh, it's the frequent turnover. In our system, folks like me who are appointed politically in these jobs, uh, oftentimes don't come to the job uh, with sufficient history, background, and experience uh, to know how to negotiate with their Chinese uh, counterparts. So on average of two and a half years, sometimes shorter, um, we change over. And those changeovers then allow the other side to take the relationship which had advanced to a point and reset it right back uh, where we got to start from scratch. Meantime, our counterparts, whose names you are all very familiar with, Tsui Tian Kai was the ambassador in the US for eight years. Prior to that, he was the main uh, interlocutor for the US. Uh, before him, it was uh, uh, Zhang Yasui, uh, Zheng Zeguang, I think you all know these names, but these folks do it for a career pretty much. There, there's variations, but again, much longer term touches and approaches here, and they know the issues uh, cold. So we need to address that. You know, in the U.S. sense, this is my equation, but you, you have words, you have commitments, and you have white papers that say, this is what we're going to do. That in itself isn't the, you know, the basis for trust, but then you, then you follow up with those with deeds. So I say I'm going to do this, and then you do those things, and that is the basis of trust, and that's in a very American perspective. Every time I would have this conversation with on the other side, they would say, Oh, no, 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 we need to refer back to the important consensus of our leaders. The fact that our presidents agreed to this happening, therefore we need to take action, not based on trust, but by direction from top down. So then the relationship follows in our ideas, right? The relationship based on trust is the foundation that we build on as we then uh, get after these, these, these debates, these disagreements and such. Uh, the other side characterizes the relationship uh, you know, they, the China-Pakistan relationship is an all-weather relationship of strategic cooperation or something like that. 
they bend the relationships into uh, different character types, which I find very interesting. So they're very focused on the relationship. And oftentimes we are asked then to engage on the basis of fixing the relationship. And my point back was, we can't really fix the high level relationship until we get at these basic issues of trust and, and understanding. Um, in negotiations, Americans tend to make the first move. Well, we can't stand silence. It makes us uncomfortable. Uh, we don't have patience. We need to get this thing going because we got to get home and, and, and solve this, this problem. And so we will put things on the table uh, and, and, that, and to begin the discussion. And we will make uh, concessions in good faith. Uh, the Chinese side looks for the best opportunity to engage. They're more patient. They will wait until the conditions are right, then they will engage. So you have a kind of impatience versus a more uh, uh, strategic, perhaps, view. We believe in fairness, as I said before. Uh, we can't see an agreement that's entirely lopsided as being uh, resilient or lasting, and it won't. Uh, on the other side, the PRC likes, you know, this is more of a win-lose, black and white, one or zero uh, effort. And someone's going to win and someone's going to lose in each of these. Uh, that's a historical cultural uh, artifact. Finally, the, the gem of the realm, the, 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 the thing we really, really want is that small group one-on-ones office call where we can bear our souls with our counterpart in private and really hear what the issues are and work them. And that is a very useful approach. It's worked in my experience in other uh, settings uh, quite well. The counter to that on the Chinese side, interestingly, is these lavish banquets. They serve a couple of purposes. One, in the Chinese culture, it shows respect. Back to that earlier slide. It shows respect to your guests that you would go to all this trouble to host a banquet. It's, it's that's culture. Just Americans don't necessarily have that same view. Okay, so there's it's a positive thing. Uh, but the second part of that is prior to about 2012, uh, the Mao Tai would flow, the Baijiu uh, would flow, and that would loosen lips, and it would get to about the same thing as that small group one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes, not always. Uh, but since the um, restrictions on Baijiu, where it's now basically red wine, they tend to be a little more sullen events. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, look, if we get back to you know get those two one-on-one -on -one exchanges and and the kind of the uh, the uh, happy banquets, I think we would move a lot further in the relationship. And, and finally, in our agreements, we believe credibility is key and that's what keeps people coming back. It builds trust. I say I'm gonna do it, I did it, therefore I'm credible. You can wreck that credibility quite easily, one misstep and suddenly your credibility is damaged. Uh, from the lecture yesterday, uh, we heard, uh, I think a very interesting point that treaty compliance uh, is, um, uh, optional. It, it is not. And uh, we have to make that point very, very clear. So examples, I mentioned in my uh, uh, opening in this, in the flyer that we talk about those. I think the 80s were the high water mark of this relationship. Uh, when I was part of it, I went to Beijing in 88. I gave a speech in December of 2019. That if you want, you can reference. It's about, an hour, it's about a half hour long. And it's a 40 year summary and survey of all of those interactions. And and the, you know, the positive outcomes of the relationship. I mean, nothing more um, telling than uh, President Clinton's ushering of the PRC into the World Trade Organization. Even though they hadn't met the criteria, there was this aspiration that they would rise to the occasion. Uh, we went through the Obama era, uh, alphabet uh, soup era of the strategic economic dialogue, the strategic security dialogue, the, the diplomatic security dialogue, that was the Trump uh, administration. And the defense side, we had the uh, defense policy talks, the defense policy coordination talks, uh, the comprehensive economic dialogue, et cetera. My experience is we didn't get a whole lot out of those. There were no real, um, uh, we were seen as talking and yes, there were some marginal uh, positive outcomes, but in general, these were more substance, these more form over substance. It uh, showed the world that the US and China were cooperating and, and could resolve our differences. To the American side, that's not enough. There's got to be some uh, hard outcomes that uh, resolve friction or at least address the frictions that uh, continue to grow in the relationship. Some of those frictions are things like reaching out. When we call our counterpart, we expect the other side to pick up, and that is not the same uh, perspective from the other side. So when Secretary Austin called back in March, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get someone on the side to pick up. Uh, an oddity that's come here recently, something that we're not used to, is demands. Uh, after the uh, interaction with the Australians, the Chinese issued 14 demands to their, China, their Australian counterparts, which again, kind of strikes the Western ear uh, a little hard. And 
The Deputy Secretary also uh, was issued two lists of demands that the U.S. must you know, uh, achieve, things that we must do before the relationship can get better. Again, noted. Um, and then I think one of the more telling ones is, again, the very strategic view on engagement and the use of engagement uh, to their own advantage. So when John Kerry flew to, in, theoretically, Beijing to have these meetings, he ended up in Tianjin, again, outside of Beijing. That's a message. And his interaction was via Zoom. He could have done that uh, back home, and yet he burned all that fossil fuel and landed in China and didn't get anything of what he wanted. Uh, and it was sort of an unnecessary um, jab at the, at the American side. What was also interesting was at the same time that Kerry was in Tianjin, the Taliban was in Beijing as they're having face-to-face -face dialogue. So all these things are tests. They're testing how bad the Americans want the relationship. They're testing what our tolerance for friction is and all the rest. And we need to approach it from that side. We, we just need to understand that it's not necessarily meant as a poke in the eye or that they don't value the relationship. They are testing us to see how, how much uh, we want to uh, give and what we can accept. And, and as I said in one of my three takeaways, simply having a meeting is not uh, a measure of effectiveness. You have to set objectives that are measurable and then measure against those. Engagement is not cost free. I think there are many who believe that, okay, talks are good um, no matter how they happen. As I mentioned, flying to, Beijing, flying to Tianjin and then doing a VTC, that, uh, that, that actually imposes cost on the US side. Um, if you're having these talks, but you're not getting at the issues, uh, those issues continue to fester and get worse while people believe they're being addressed. And that, you know, it's a recipe for uh, an, ex you know, an explosion, uh, bad outcome. Uh, I was there for the ardent suitor period. The ardent suitor was the, you know, it's the high school kid who's, you know, enamored with the, the pretty girl, but she won't give him the time of day. And we're going to all these ex efforts to, to get some time or have, you know, go out on a date. Um, that's how we felt, is it's trying to get the PLA to engage. We felt like the ardent suitor. Uh, the one who is begging for the relationship, their reputation is diminished. And it does make, it, you see some stratification there as to who's more important, who's less important. That's by design. Uh, the world follows our lead. So if we do these things in a positive way, it results in positive engagement. Uh, our sending uh, Alex Azar to Taiwan in August of uh, last year, and then Keith Kroc uh, in September, I think uh, enabled others, empowered others. The Czechs uh, shortly after that sent 90 of their legislators to Taiwan on a trade mission. Uh, these are things that we do in engagement that give others the latitude to engage, and we should Keep that in mind. At the same time, uh, if we do engage wholeheartedly and if the PRC does get us to really get involved in some good beneficial talks, there will always be concerns about a G2, that the US and China are gonna make a deal to the exclusion of the interests of everybody else in the region. Gotta keep that in mind. Uh, and then again, there's risk of, of making these, uh, having these engagements where like Australia right now has been just taking it on the chin in terms of trade uh, for asking for a reasonable investigation of the origins of the COVID uh, and other uh, issues, uh, there's been some serious trade implications. And so uh, when we do engage, we have to make sure that we coordinate with our allies and partners. We, we back brief them and let them know what was said just so they don't feel like they've been cut out. So here's the so what, how do we bring them to the table? Um, you know, I learned in diplomacy that uh, there's this thing called the false choice. We're either talking or we're not talking. Well, there's a third choice is we can talk, but we can talk in public by some quiet, you know, private uh, exchanges. And if they aren't going to accept these conversations or, or for some reason cannot accept them, then as I showed earlier, the, the Chinese side has been very good at public diplomacy and public messaging. Uh, when it's not positive or happy, they call it uh, megaphone diplomacy. Okay. Um, and the key here is if we do touch on legitimacy issues, if we talk about Uyghur genocide or Hong Kong or, or Taiwan, and it calls into question the legitimacy of the Communist Party and this new type of governance, uh, you have to be careful what um, the re response will be, although it can be used uh, to encourage them to come to the table in good faith and have a conversation. Uh, at the bottom here, you'll see a quote uh, related to recent conversation in the Congress about legislation about boycotting the upcoming Olympics in February of 22. Um, and their words are that it will negate goodwill and positive momentum. 
And then a lot of people buy that. They say, yeah, you're right, we don't want to do that. My question is, what goodwill and what positive momentum? I think most people would agree that the relationship really is um, pretty much at, at near the bottom and it can only go up. So we need to uh, keep that in mind, but don't buy those lines. Don't accept that there's goodwill or positive momentum just because the state says that. So as we practice this um, more public diplomacy, there are not just words we can take, there are actions we can take. And one of those, as I mentioned, is the discussions of a boycott. And we can have that conversation. If you look at what happened in the 80s after the Soviet Union invaded, invaded Afghanistan, it was sort of a mixed bag about exactly you know, how that panned out, what the results were. So I'm not here advocating for it. I'm just saying it's one of those things that's been put out there. Uh, but again, we need to consider how else do we engage China on a vital US interest, human rights, right? This is something that we, we believe very strongly in, not just in China, but everywhere, to include our own country. Uh, so what are the other ways of encouraging the PRC to you know, manage this issue better or have a conversation about it and engage on that? And the last one, the issue that's in the news constantly these days is adventurism against Taiwan, is the risk of invasion of Taiwan and those things. If you look at historical examples, I don't think we're there. Uh, if you look at the Korea example, for instance, you know, before the PRC rolled into the Korean War in October of 1950, they made a lot of diplomatic and other overtures uh, that unfortunately we did not listen to. And I do believe that would happen again. And there's considerable uh, scholarship on that. So the fact that we're not talking to me is a good thing uh, because if we're having talks and then they're breaking down uh, that's the first uh, warning. Here's some diplomacy, uh, public diplomacy examples, good and bad. Uh, I was there when Gary Locke was the ambassador to PRC. He's Chinese American. Uh, and boy, they really wire brushed him on the way out there. They called him a yellow skinned, white hearted banana man. Uh, and there were further <laughs> insults in there. It, that's just uncalled for. And yet th this happens. I showed you other examples of that happening today. Personal and ad, ha ad hominem attacks. Um, the upper right, uh, there's more, uh, here's a better example, is basically saying uh, China is going to engage on uh, the basis of mutual respect. Again, I would ask to, you know, all to question the, what the meaning of that is, what that ulterior motive might be with the words uh, mutual respect. But I'm a big fan of graphics, as you can tell on that bottom right one, I think is really well done. I don't agree with it, but it shows China drawing and building bridges while the U.S. is erasing them. That you know, those images resonate, people pick up on those. So we have to come up with images of our own. Doesn't always work though. Uh, when the border conflict with India was at, at its high tilt, you know, the public diplomacy, uh, this, this was one of those, I think this was a tweet, basically bragging about them launching their own space station while India was dealing with uh, the, you know, the COVID pandemic, which originated in China and mocking the fact that so many Indians were dying. This had a major impact. This is failed diplomacy, a major impact on the Indian uh, assessment of the relationship with the PRC, and it hasn't recovered since, so you gotta be careful. And then um, these images matter. It's the pandas leaning back, the eagles leaning forward, that shows aggression. And the title is, the onus is on the US to avoid a Cold War. At the same time, they quote um, Graham Allison and his Thucydides trap that says that you, you know, in this, uh, you got to establish power and a rising power and war is inevitable if the established power does not get out of the way of the rising power. You can, we can debate whether that's a valid uh, conclusion or not. But to the Chinese point here, the you know, avoidance of Cold War is going to be, uh, onus will be on the rising power side, not the established status quo side. The imagery and the word work, and this is a good example of public diplomacy. And you'll always, you constantly see these words, meet China halfway, implying that the relationship is heavily skewed in the U.S.'s favor and that we just need to, you know, exercise that fairness to get it back on balance. Well, I think we know in terms of trade and a number of other things, you know, diplomats, et cetera, media access, it is skewed very hard in China's favor, and yet they're asking us for it to give more. I'm not debating them, I think that it's a good use of language. I'm over time here, I'll just talk, uh, just basically, let's talk about economic engagement. This is engagement as well. Uh, decoupling versus disentangling. The Chinese like the word decoupling that assumes that we can clip one part of US-China economic trade and not affect others. Uh, I think it's more of two trees that have grown together and you've got these root balls and we are deterred from taking action and engaging on these uh, you know, on bad practices uh, because if we cut a root, it could be ours, it could be theirs, we don't know and we will incur damage as well. Um, just something to think about when we engage in the economics here. Then I'll leave it at this for discussion. 
Uh, on the bottom, Secretary Panetta came to the PRC in August of 12, and it was a really interesting uh, meeting. Look at, look at the Secretary's body language there. Uh, it's very relaxed, and, and often you don't see that. What you see is, a, is this leaning in behavior, uh, and, and that it gives the visual of the, U, the US side being needy. Um, so when we engage, we have to engage smartly and, and understand how the Chinese side engages as well. And then the picture on the right is, again, one of the better uh, mill-mill interactions we had uh, in Beijing. This is the then Defense Minister Liang Guangli and out front of their Pentagon, the Baiyi building. Anyway, read the lines there. I'll kill the uh, slides and uh, look forward to your questions.